Um, now we're recording. All right, thanks everybody for getting on today. This is our first meeting in our series of farmer's market meetings. Um, introduction to farmer's market, sorry, cat. <laughs> Today, our speakers are Stacey Huffman, who's the a &R agent in Mineral County, and Emily Morrow, who's the a &R agent in Jefferson County. And they're gonna talk about marketing for profit. Uh, but before we get started, we have just a few poll questions. So I'm gonna bring those up real quick. All right, can everybody see those? Somebody give me a thumbs up. All right, so take a second to answer the poll questions. All right, anybody else need to answer the poll questions? We just admitted one person. Okay. Give it just a second. Yeah. All right, if you're just getting on, we're answering a few questions before we get started um, to just give us some information about um, who you are and what you're planning to sell. And you can't scroll down. There's a third question. If you don't see that, a couple of you have not answered the third question. All right. Um, I'm going to share these results really fast. Um, so it looks like we have a good mix of people that are on the meeting. Um, we also have a good variation in what you're planning on selling. So thank you guys for taking those poll questions. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Emily and Stacy to get started. All right, so um, I think Emily is going to pull up our presentation for today, but um, it looks like we have a lot of aspiring vendors today, which is exciting. We love that. Um, so bear with us as we go through this today, because have you all ever heard the expression hitting a moving target? Okay, so in the world of, and no offense to my agency people, but in the world of regulations and rules and codes and who's in charge of what, um, the farmer's market world is like hitting a moving target. So we're gonna try to update you as, as current as we know and that we understand. And we definitely invite any folks on here, whether you're a current market vendor or whether you're an agency folks, like if you work for Department of Ag, um, if you can share insight as we go too, as far as making sure that we're staying on point, um, we, would, we would greatly appreciate that. All right, Emily, I think you can start her off there. Okay, so the big question this year is, um, you know, are there any major things with COVID uh, policies and rules and regulations? So if you're a new vendor, don't worry, it's not as bad as you think. So if you're a new vendor, um, think about just normal kind of safety protocol, um, you know, hand sanitizer at your station, don't be your normal kind of stuff, don't be you know, don't be touching everything, um, wiping your nose and then touching everything again. So this is normal safety stuff. Okay, guys, um, if you are, a, do we have any market vendors on here? I don't know if that was part of the questionnaire. Did I see market vendor people? 
we yeah, there did were, not there were have, a few. we had current vendors um no market managers okay well current vendors you all can take this back to your markets um and please feel free to unmute yourself if you have questions just pop them right in there okay but if you're a market manager or if you're a vendor and especially if you're if your market's bigger um, you know, it's so like Mineral County where I'm at, we know we might have 15, 20 vendors and we're in a big old open parking lot. So there's not really much we have to worry about in the way of flow of traffic. We have plenty of space. If you're in a tighter area, whether that's a bigger city or a town or a weird kind of parking lot where you're in tighter conditions, some COVID things that you might want to think about as a market in general would be to um, think about your flow of traffic. So if you were to be, you know, if you were to take a drone and fly it up above, how, how would you look at this market and say, okay, if I can keep everybody moving a certain way, would that reduce some, um, you know, some population being next to each other? Would that reduce people being too close to each other as they're shopping along the vendors? So you, we've heard of several different examples last year of markets creating signage at the beginning of the markets that would have arrows and tell them which way to flow through the market. So those are just some simple, basic, logic, logical kind of things to think about. Um, how are people moving through your market? Or do you have hand sanitizer? If you control the flow of market, do you want to change up vendors? You know, at the beginning, so that way you're not um, you're not being favorite to one particular vendor at the beginning. So those are just some things to think about as far as regulations. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but there are no regulations specific to farmers markets. There's the normal stuff, like for any business, that means like you're gonna wear your face mask, okay? You're going to use hand sanitizer, or you're gonna have hand washing stations when available, but there's nothing specific to farmers market. Um, any of my agency people on here, if you wanna, if you, if you know something different, please let us know, but, um, Right now, we're going to treat this like any other business. Um, all right, Emily. Okay, so here's what we're going to cover today, guys. This is your route to the market. If you're a new vendor, or if you're, you know, maybe you're relatively new, or you're you're um, a pro at this, this is like think of this as Jumanji in the different levels of the farmers market. Your easiest level of the farmer's market is if you're gonna sell uncut produce, guess what? You're in, no big deal. All you do is you talk to your local farmer's market <clears throat> about what kind of policies they have. Do they have any kind of forms for you to fill out, like a vendor application, um, things like that. So, but as far as the Department of Ag goes, uncut produce, they're not gonna worry about you. <clears throat> and that came, you know, that was a change last year, or I'm sorry, last week. So as of new legislation last week, um, if you're selling whole zucchini, whole tomatoes, you don't have to worry about any kind of permits. Um, you just have to check with your local markets. As you go up this little triangle here, or this little pyramid, I'm sorry, it's going to get a little bit harder. So level two, if you want to level up, uh, level two is your jams and jellies and things like that that are non-hazardous, more processed foods. Then you go up to your acidic foods like salsas and things like that, which Everything, every time you level up comes with new forms, new permits and things like that, new uh, steps to take to be able to sell. So we get to the meat and dairy. And um, if you guys saw on your schedule, we'll actually have some folks that specifically talk about meat and dairy later. Um, I think it's maybe next week, right, Jody? Um, they talk about meats and dairies and the specifics about what uh, permits and things like that you need to have. It's May 18th. May 18th, sorry. That's totally not next week. All right, Emily. Oh, and does meat and dairy, dairy include eggs? So eggs would be kind of a step. If we had to add another layer to that pyramid, eggs would be right underneath meat. Um, so you can sell eggs. It's not that big of a deal. You have to have a label and you have to, um, you do have to have a form. So it's, it's a level in there. It's not the highest level, but you do have to, to jump through a couple hoops. But we'll get specific with that later too. Hey, no problem, Carrie. Uh, we went through these, the COVID precautions. So just wear your mask. Um, I have seen, if, if, if you're like me, you've seen so many of our farmer's market vendors that are smoking. I hate that. Don't smoke at your stand. 
Um, I mean, don't smoke in general, but don't smoke at your stand, but especially wear your face mask. And um, I think, you know, that's going to make everyone feel comfortable and um, social distancing signage. And I think the West Virginia Farmers Market Association had some examples of signage on there. So we can use those examples. So now we're going to jump into covering different types of displays and what you can do to draw people with to your stand and make it look aesthetically pleasing and ultimately boost sales. And as we go through, we have some specific pictures from farmers markets. Um, a lot of these are from those where I cover in the eastern panhandle. Several of those are also from um, Mineral County and Stacy's Neck of the Woods, too. So we'll also point out some of the different things Stacy's already mentioned as far as the different products and the regulations that are required as well as some of the safety precautions you'll notice farmers taking at their stands. Um, some of these pictures are taken pre-COVID, some of them are taken post-COVID. So a good farmer's market stand, no matter where you're selling, um, some of you may sell um, off the farm, may sell off the side of the road at far farm stands, but the majority of you might be pursuing routes directly into the market. So ideally, you want people to stop and you want them to come to you and you want them to make a sale. So when you are designing your stand, you want to help make, take the guesswork out of your products and your prices. Um, it's kind of awkward when you are a customer and you're standing there and you're not sure how much something costs. So you're waiting for the producer to free up. Um, they're already talking to, to another customer, finishing out that transaction. So you're kind of standing there waiting for them to work their way over to you. Um, and if you have to wait too long as a customer, you might end up walking away and walking somewhere else. Maybe you're not feeling that the, the producer is giving you the attention when you're the one with the money in hand. So by knowing exactly how much something costs and exactly what it is you're buying, um, you don't have to have those extra questions and it takes the guesswork completely out. And ideally you have a diversified product mix. Um, so when I know when I'm shopping at a market or I'm shopping anywhere, I always like to look for multiple things I can buy, um, especially if I'm gonna swipe my card or something. I just wanna feel like I have that extra bang for my buck. So all customers kind of feel the same way. Um, some of these basic principles on selling anything definitely apply to selling food. And don't be afraid to get creative with your stands. Playing up with the colors and tablecloths and different modes of display goes a long way and all of those increase the ability of people that want to stop, they want to see what you have, and they want to buy it ultimately. So this is an example of one of our vendors in Shepherdstown. They were selling vegetable plants and um, herbs. So they had every single flat marked very, very clearly. You knew you're buying spinach. There was no, is this cabbage? I'm not sure exactly what this is. So you know what you're buying and that freed up the, the vendor from having to answer some of those questions. And here's a couple other examples from that level one Stacy was talking about, that raw, uncut produce. Um, if you are working on your route to the market, this is going to be the easiest place to start because you don't have those extra regulations. Chances are your markets are going to be looking for specific vendors that can sell certain crops. Um, like here, uh, this was a picture I snagged off the Martinsburg Farmer's Market. Um, they're selling okra. So that's kind of a different crop mix that maybe some of those vendors are looking for when it comes to diversifying. Um, we have a couple markets here in Jefferson County, Shepherdstown and Charlestown. Then there's one that kind of goes on and off on Wednesdays throughout the year. Shepherdstown Farmer's Market does not want 20 different people selling tomatoes. They want to accept you because they want to know you're selling something different. So some of our vendors um, go to vote both markets and maybe they don't bring their carrots to one market because they have enough carrot producers, but they bring them to the other market. So if you're uncertain, even at this stage on what you want to grow, Head into the market in the peak season and seeing what's available and what's not available is going to give you a really great idea on where there might be holes in your community that you can fit. And again, this guy from this is pre COVID picture, so he's not wearing a, a mask. Um, is, he's got a great display, nice tablecloth, broccoli, clearly marked, um, interesting ways to display the products as well. 
So you want to market your products well um, and mark them well in terms of what they are and how much they cost. Um, this is the the one of our vendors. They have a variety of products. They have herbs on one side, very clearly marked. Each flat you're getting three dollars, and you can see all those different um, little plant holders that are marking the variety. And um, you can see a tablecloth goes a long way on a, on a farm market stand. It just, even if you've not washed that tablecloth all season, it gives the illusion of cleanliness and that you put together um, and it just, it just makes you want to stop and it looks pretty. Uh, now, sometimes our vendors just forget their tablecloths and that's going to happen just like you forget your lunch when you walk out the door getting ready to go to work. This vendor in particular is selling um, eggs. And um, we'll get into the specifics with that when it comes to the meat and dairy and egg portion on May 18th. But the very, very basics is um, eggs at a farmer's market still need to be labeled. Um, the label just needs to look very basic and specify that they're ungraded. You might specify when they were packaged, a use by date, um, uh, and they need to have a name and address on them as well. So this is just one of the examples that Department of Ag puts out. And then this stand um, was at Charlestown Farmers Market, and uh, sh this producer has been producing for since um, the late 80s or so. So she's kind of got it down for a science. And the best advice she gave me when, when I said, hey, I'm going to take some pictures. This is what we're using it for. She's like, oh, I've got all great advice for you. I have found my herbs at this market are my best sellers. If I put them over here off to the side, um, people don't stop. People don't look at them. So she says, I put them in front down where people are walking past and I put them lower. I don't put them at eye level. They're even lower to the ground. So people see them better. Somehow they see them better when they're lower to the ground and they smell them. So that gets more people to stop and buy. And that's just one of the different tricks that she's found through her product mix in um, her particular market that really works for her. And then you'll see on the side, she's got some other varieties as well. Um, they do a lot of flowers and vegetable plants. They tell you right up front, this is the type of card payment that I accept. And this is how you can find me online if you are interested in following their farm. And you can see um, she's wearing her mask. And she's got the Germex right up front and center so you can sanitize if you'd like. So I'm going to turn it back over to Stacy for the next couple slides. Okay, so um, this is actually one of um, Emily's, where'd you get this from? Shepherdstown? Uh, this is Charlestown. Charlestown, sorry. Okay, um, as you can see, there's not a lot of produce on the table, right? So as a vendor, if you're going to show up early, let's say you want to show up to the market now, but you don't have much, you need to figure out a way to fill your table. So maybe it's with other different, you know, other products. Um, this guy's got firewood, which firewood we do not sell. You cannot, you should not and could not, should not sell it across uh, county lines, right? You should kind of keep firewood local. Um, so there's, there's different things on this table that we should all be thinking about when it comes to proper communications with folks. So if you're going to be selling firewood, I know this sounds kind of weird, but if you're going to be selling firewoods to local campers, let them know that, hey, keep this local. Do not be transported. Like if you buy it in Jefferson County, don't be taking it down to Southern West Virginia for your campsites. Okay. Don't be taking it on vacation. Get firewood local. Um, so as a vendor, it is important to communicate with your folks. It is also good if you have this table, like this picture here, and you only have a few things on the table, let them know, hey, in a couple weeks, I'm going to have broccoli. Or in a couple weeks, guess what? The tomatoes are coming on. Um, so let them know what's coming up. If you don't, they're going to look at your table. They might buy one thing and they're going to get disappointed and they're not going to come back to you next week unless they know that something's coming around the corner. So if it is something that, you know, you're just trying to fill gaps in, communication is a really big key for people. Um, whether that's signage or just talking to folks, but a big sign just to say, hey, in the next coming weeks, this is what you can expect. People love that. Um, okay, Emily. Oh, okay, so this is, uh, oh, this will be a big one. I saw a lot of folks who were looking to sell meat on here. So when we, this guy's selling, um, you know, different 
different meat cuts he's selling. Um, we've got some bacon on there and I can't see all the sun. I'm not very good at reading that far away, but he's selling all kinds of different meat. On May 18th, we have a meat topic. And so that's going to be a specific one. What are your rules? What are your regulations for selling meat? Um, but this guy has, has done really well setting up his display. He has a nice sign. He could have, I mean, if he's selling meat, he didn't plop his old dirty cooler up there on top of the table. He has a nice display. He's got boards clearly marking exactly what he has. Um, as a consumer, if you walk up to a table and you are not uh, up on how to ask for meat, and I know that sounds stupid, we have a lot of people up there who come up and say, I want some bacon, but I have no idea what it's sold like. Is it sold by the pound? Do I buy it like a chunk? You know, you get a lot of crazy questions at the farmer's market, but this guy clearly lays out what he's selling and how much it is. And that's for, you know, that's for every table that you have. So you have to clearly mark what it is and clearly mark the prices. This guy has made it very easy for someone to come up and buy from his table. Okay. And another thing to notice, you know, there's not a whole lot of fun things to put on a display when you have nothing but meat. Obviously, you're not going to plop the meat on the table because it needs to stay in the cooler. So he's kind of filled up that space and um, didn't bring too much space where it looks like you have a big old empty cooler. You know, they got their price list and their cash box. And that's really all you need on the yeah. table like this. Pictures would be nice if he wanted to add something to it. So if you are selling meats um, and we'll see some pictures of some recipe cards later. But yeah, if he wanted to, you know, have some recipe cards of things that you can make with the meats he's selling or if you, you know, maybe a couple of pictures of the recipes themselves, um, that might be an added little bonus. It's not a have to, but always think any way you can hold that customer's hand and help them. So whether it's, you know, okay, think in mind like these mail order programs like HelloFresh or I know there's a bunch of them out there, like those ones they deliver you the meal, right? Why is that popular? Because those companies have made it easy for consumers. They get their stuff, they open up all their packages, they know what to do with it. So when you have customers coming to you, you need to make it easy for them. If this guy wants to make it easier, he could put recipes up there. Hey, take this uh, hamburger home or take this whatever else he's selling. Oh, wow, he's selling rabbit. Okay, so take, take this, I think it's, it says rabbit. Yeah. Take this rabbit home and here's a recipe for this. Here's how you use this. So. Um, it really helps people. If I got up there, I'm not going to lie to you. I'd, I'd be looking at, oh, a whole rabbit. That sounds like fun. And then think, what the heck am I going to do with a whole rabbit? But if he had a recipe out there, I would be more apt to buy that whole rabbit. So, there, sorry. That's an excellent point. If you're selling anything that's a little out of the ordinary, um, holding their hand, like Stacy said, and giving, guiding them to how to use that product. So it doesn't have to be a whole rabbit. If you're selling okra or any type of raw uncut produce, you know, that's your in in the market. You're selling something nobody else is selling. Um, giving people instructions and ideas on how to use that product. It's going to go a long way and help make you that, make that sale. Has anyone ever seen the programs like HelloFresh and those mail order, like meals? Have you seen those? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, I think they're awesome. Yeah, yeah. they're handy, they're right? Yeah, and you don't have as, as much of a leftovers or mess to clean up afterwards. And, and my golly, if, you, if we have someone <laughs> like an ag agent like Brandy here saying, yeah, those things are awesome, that's a big deal, guys. I mean, if we're having someone who grows her own food saying that meal deliveries are awesome, it's because of convenience. So when it comes down to it, if you make it easy, and those, the customers don't have to think too much. We're going to love it. So uh, Brandy, I appreciate that because I, I had never had experience, but my, um, one of my friends had HelloFresh and I was over there for a meal and man, they had, they had these beautiful recipe cards and had step-by-step -step everything you did with all the produce that was in that box. It was pretty neat. Yeah. Very, made it very easy. So I can see why people buy into it. And those companies are smart. And, um, so here's the thing, farmers are smart too. You guys grow produce better than anybody we know. And we obviously know that local is better. So it's just about how we can market this and how we can help the customers see that. One, one reason I started it, it was a, there was a coupon, there was a discount. They partnered with another company to offer a discount for trying like 12 meals. So it's kind oh. of a bait. 
So that yeah, might we, be a idea. Yeah, we subscribed to HelloFresh for a while and we really enjoyed it. It was really easy for me in terms of meal prep and in terms of the recipes were really good and they actually gave us ideas for future things we can make on our own, so. Yeah, they're marketing geniuses. I mean, you got to admit they are, I don't know where their produce is coming from. Who knows, right? But their marketing is spot on. It is, it is. So. And on that same train of thought, um, when I was taking a marketing class in my undergraduate, I remember our, our teacher um, telling us how she noticed one of the vendors at, I, I don't know if it was the Morgantown Farmer's Market or another place she had lived, noticed that the vendor noticed that people were coming up and buying onions and tomatoes and their cilantro and garlic. So what did they do? They put it all together in a kit and gave them a recipe and like, here's a salsa kit. So I noticed, you notice what your customers are buying and then fine tuning it to fit is was a really smart pivot on their part. Um, oh, and our, our nutrition people do the same thing. We, when we do our demos, our healthy living demos, we do our stir fry things and and right there we have laid out today's produce this is what's available and this is how you can combine it um and it's remarkable like you mentioned a few minutes ago um today we have this uh zucchini and this is what we have today and if you've never tried it before here's a way to cook it so that's another option is yep and brandy mentioned those coupons just like jody said you know brandy you maybe you show up at a vendor one day maybe you're that vendor okay and onions, you got onions out your ears that week, okay? So maybe you throw onions in whatever meal kit you're making that day, and it you throw it in some salsa kits, right? You, you make it a little discount. Hey, this this week's uh, meal of the or you know produce pack of the week is this salsa kit, and it's this discount. And maybe you just throw in the pepper, or maybe you throw in the onions just for fun, you know, make them think they're getting something, and um, that's a great little package. So just make sure you're following all requirements like if you are doing um, preparation or um, food demos and things like that there are requirements uh, from the health department and things like that that you have to have so make sure you're following those rules right yeah and that that's also a really good point that um, as you move up those levels like like Stacy mentioned at the beginning um, the raw uncut produce really nothing you need to do for it once you if you cut your produce in any way then there's additional requirements mm -hmm. um, some of those come from the department of agriculture but then others um, sometimes you have additional requirements on the local level we're in the eastern panhandle um, we're a higher dense area our health department is a little bit more stringent than some counties so sometimes it's on a county by county basis on what you need if you're selling things um, certain things that might be subject to potentially get people sick, um, things things like meat and eggs and and certain certain different levels. But again, we get it all into that um, later in the session. So that's that's a whole nother hour in itself. Going back to the marketing, um, this is another example of a this these two young ladies are brand new vendors. Um, they had a hole in the farmers market. We really needed a producer. They were thinking about it for a while. Grew enough to for themselves and they said we're in don't know what we're gonna grow but we'll figure it out as we get there so they were looking for things now it's april to fill up their their stand while everything else started coming into season so they have this really beautiful display um you know all these vendors i've i've shown have their farm very clearly marked um a banner or something in the background um and then they have this like wonderfully done chalkboard i'm not sure who drew this but that's the cleanest chalkboard i've ever seen in my life and as things are sold out mark it off the list so people know i can't go to them to get my spring salad mix i might have to go down down the aisle a little bit ways to to find that um they started doing this granola just to fill up the stand basically while they're waiting for some of their other warm weather crops to um, be able to plant those in and while they're waiting for more lettuce to come in as well so they clearly list the prices the products um and what's left and they're also um on their farm sign um i don't think you can see it because they're in front of it and also on their chalkboard um, they drive people to their social media and um, depending on the way you market that's a huge thing over here um, that's that's what you want you want people to be able to follow you and know where to find you and what you have so on that train of thought that's that's a great point on um 
if you sell at the market and you're active on social media, making a quick post and telling people what you have that week and reminding them, hey, I'm going to be at the farmer's market next, the Charlestown Farmer's Market on Saturday, and this is what I have. And here's some pictures of what I have too. Um, so these two different farms are ones that I, I showed pictures of. Um, and the Middleway Farm, um, Charlestown is on Saturday, Shepherdstown is on Sunday. They posted this a full day ahead of market. So they were giving people time to um, get on and look at it and maybe plan their trip to market. Um, Sister Moon Farm posted theirs the morning of as soon as market opened. Um, so I'm not sure which strategy might work better. Um, and social media were very instant. Typically, Shepherdstown um, is more of very regular repeat customers. So in this case, I'd say both of those strategies work because the Shepherdstown people know they're going. They're a new farm. They're trying to get people to stop. So they're just letting people know that we're going to be there and this is what we have. Um, the customers are already coming. Now their goal is to get them to buy from them. Charlestown, it's more of a different environment. And sometimes people go, sometimes people don't. So by posting it a whole day in advance, you're giving all that extra time for people to make their plans for Saturday to go to market and purchase from them. This is just an, I have just a couple more ex examples of displays for different products. Um, Kurt here in Shepherdstown has, sells honey. Um, he also sells beeswax candles. So he has um, a few different types of products that he always has in season. And he kind of uses um, different ways of, of layering his products. He's got his, his nesting boxes with his last name on it just to layer things and make it look really cool. His tent even matches the candles. So I thought that was pretty, pretty clever of him. Again, he's wearing his mask. So he knows that he's following the protocols. He's got Santa sanitizer right there on um, on the stand and his sign that he had made um, mentions his production practices right there um, and that's an, a good example of him knowing his audience and what the questions that they're going to ask and answering that right up front. Um, a different type of honey vendor at a different market um, he uses, he actually teams up with another vendor that does the jams and jellies and they sell them together on one stand. So they have a wide variety of different flavors. Um, again, when we get to value added, we'll have those um, labeling requirements covered, but his big marketing push is that they're veteran owned companies. So he has a really good cause and he wants people to know it. And then they kind of get that feel good feeling when they're when they're buying from him. Um, and you can see like his stand is huge. I've so many jams and jellies. And then he um, also gets a little creative with um, the different uh, fabrics that they use to, to, to wrap everything up. So it, it's very aesthetically pleasing and uh, gets draws people in. And then the last um, example I have is maybe you're not even a food vendor and you're thinking about other products. We saw a few examples of these and some of the other images. Um, you can almost smell this picture just by looking at it. All this vendor does is soaps. And um, there's there's not um, additional tiers or, or levels associated with needing to, to sell these types of products, but they're still sought after in markets. Um, they want other examples of things that people can buy. People are going to the market to buy local. Um, so she has an interesting product. She's got a good display here. All the flavors, um, flavors, I'm not tasting the soap. I don't know if you are, but all of the, the different um, smells are very clearly marked as well. And oh my gosh, this, this smelled so good. It just really drew you right in. So her products did all the talking for her. She didn't even need to say a word. And I know if you want to, if you want to taste the soap, that must mean it smells really good. Yeah, yeah. I imagine um, there's see there's some lavender there, just some some delicious delicious different flavors. <laughs> so I'm gonna turn it back over to Stacy. She's gonna talk more about um, special events and ways to get people to market. All right, guys. So um, vendors, if like I said, if you individual vendors can do, I want to call like special events yourself. But it, it's more impactful if you can do it as a market. So um, this picture right here is just off of our, our Facebook page. Again, remember, we only have 15, 20 vendors. You know, it's not a huge market. But what we did for a special event is um, this is back in, and this is just a random picture because I, I really like the look of that sandwich. And I could go for that sandwich pretty much every day. 
So what we did is we worked with our um, nutrition outreach instructor. She came to our market and did this little cooking demo. And um, we got the proper permits from our local health department. So um, if you're if you are a specific vendor and you want to do something like tastings, you've got to work with your local health departments and you've got to get those those temporary food permits for that. Um, it's best if you can work with somebody like an, another agency that can go ahead and come in and do those food tastings very simply. But you can work with them on what's local. Uh, I'm sorry, what's what's current, what's in season right then. Um, but even just having the recipe cards out there. This, our cooking demos, people would come specifically for those, okay? So these are people who might not come to the market, but heck, they see this picture online and we always post at like six o'clock in the morning so folks can see it on Facebook. And they're like, yeah, I'll stop by the market. Um, maybe on my way at lunch or something, I'll swing by and I'll get a little sample and I'll go ahead and get my shopping done. So um, special events. We also had, you can have music events. So we have a little local bluegrass band. And again, it's small Mineral County. So our local bluegrass band is like two or three people. And we had them come sing. But because they know people, so it's, you know, farmers know people, but other people know people on social media. And you know how that connects. If you're a friend with friend, you're a friend with a friend, and it just goes on. So if you advertise, hey, we've got some folks that are, um, and this is, this is not our bluegrass band, by the way. This is Emily's picture. Our bluegrass men, they probably don't even know what a speaker is, but they come and they just sit down and play on a chair. So, but people love it. And so if you um, advertise some of these things, they come. That right-hand picture is from a couple years ago. It's tomato tasting. So we always have, every year we have our market tomato tasting. Okay, so how we work that is we work with our local health department and we get a temporary permit um, we use all the safety protocol. We have a little washing station. So you have to have the washing station where you can um, wash things. We have a bathroom there where folks can wash their hands. So we use all the safety protocols. But this is something simple that our farmer's market put together. And it really just takes a couple people. This tomato tasting, we got tomatoes from different farmers. And um, as, as folks walk by, and those were always covered, by the way, we just uncovered them for the picture. But um, people could walk by, they take a taste, and they vote for their favorite tomato. So it's kind of a big deal. I mean, we even have this cheesy big trophy with a weird tomato on top um, that we hand to the to the winner of whatever farmer's you know tomato won that year, and they get to hold on to that that trophy all year long, and they display it at their booth. You know what I mean? And and it's this weird thing, and people love it. Um, so we also have things like Kids Day. Um, Kids Day is where we advertise for not only um, youth vendors, so like this picture of the kid, that's actually my kid, youth vendors are free for a day, like so we pick a day, whether it's you're an FFA kid, or whether you're somebody else that's got kids that wants to sell, they can come sell to the farmer's market that day for free, they don't have to pay the fee, and so um, we also have a booth set up on Kids Day where kids can come and they get uh, farm scavenger hunts, uh, farmer's market scavenger hunts that is and they have little fun games we have little free giveaways um, usually you know we try to do fun games with them that day so we it doesn't take a huge deal to put on special events okay it doesn't have to be this big planning event it could be something simple like a kid scavenger hunt or asking a bluegrass band to come out um, the big deal is if you're going to have food for people to eat is getting those permits from the health department <coughs> Excuse me. In most cases, they're not hard to get. Um, so, but just you know, keep in contact with those folks. Okay. Sorry, Emily. Oh, that's it. That's all we got. That's it. Yeah, and another couple of things. Um, our Charlestown Market will do a Kids Day once a month, and basically they have like a teacher. You can drop your kid off, and they'll go pre-COVID. They'll lead, lead an activity with them, um, and then the parents can do the shopping. So it doesn't have to be super well orchestrated. Um, there's a lot of different levels, and every market's different. So that's also important to keep in mind. And your customers are very different as well. Um, even within the same county, the customers at Shepherdstown are a lot different than the customers at Charlestown. Now there is some overlap, but that's also important to know your market, know your customer, know where you're selling, and that's how you're going to be successful and make those yeah. sales. Someone had asked about, um, you know, tasting pre, like, you know, down during COVID. 
you can still do it. Um, you just have to go through the normal things that you did pre-COVID. Okay, so you have to talk to your local health department. Um, most, like our health, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this out loud. Our local health department works with us where if we're going to have like, um, you know, if we're going to have like a little sampling of something, even if our nutrition outreach instructor does it, technically we would have to get a temporary permit, right? We'd have to pay like 50 bucks. So, but because we're just doing it for the market, our local health department waives that fee, but they still come and make sure that we're doing things safely. Okay. So they don't make us pay, but they do make us um, play the game of safety. Um, so what was the other one? Okay. Lisa Jones says, yeah, just do the normal stuff, wear your mask. I uh, know the masks are going to be fun during the heat, and I'm sure they were a lot of fun last year during the heat, but that's something that we're just going to have to to bear through. So, Gloves, too. Very important. Oh, the plastic gloves, the gloves when you're doing, when you're serving food. Yeah. Yep. So I want to hear from our vendors on here. I see a lot of people that I know, but vendors, um, <clears throat> whether you're old, new, experienced, beginning, whatever, um, let us know what you think, you know, what kind of ideas, what kind of questions do you have? Um, what kind of reservations do you have? You know. So that means all the aspiring vendors are going to become vendors this year, right? Okay, I mean, I you guys, oh, I hear somebody talking. You guys have either yeah, left the uh, room, sorry. you don't have any questions, or you're all on board with becoming a farmer's market vendor. And we're going to pretend it's you're all on board to be a vendor. Yes. Okay. So Jessica's asked, is there any good resource for us to view the basic requirements and permits for the different tiers? So in the different tiers, the pyramid thing is something that Emily and I made up. I mean, just to kind of make it more simple to look at. Um, but if you go... the West Virginia Farmers Market site, okay? Um, it's under the West Virginia Department of Agriculture. And, oh, we're pulling up the screen right now. Okay, so this is what the front page is gonna look like. So you go into Department of Agriculture and there's something there that says what, uh, does it say Farmers Market? I'm there's gonna type it in the chat because it's kind of hard to find. Okay, she's gonna put the chat link in there. If so there's this, we're gonna call this the Farmers Market Bible, okay? It's like this, I don't know, like 50 page Bible thing for, for farmer's market vendors. It's got everything in there as far as um, the current regulations. It's got this guide that she's got up on the screen um, about whatever you're selling, what permits are required. So again, as we said, if you're selling whole produce, not cut, then you're good to go. Okay, that's level one, easiest level to participate. As you um, go down her chart, you can see you see some red popping up like required permits like for meats and things like that so it gets harder to sell um it's very doable okay and i don't want to scare anybody it's very very doable we just have to kind of go through some of those forms we basically group things you sell into two different categories that you can see potentially hazardous foods meaning it has the ability to be abused when it comes to being left out too long so time or not being stored at the proper temperature. Um, so that's what we call time temperature abuse and then non potentially hazardous foods. So those are the ones that aren't really um, subject to that same risk. And that's when it comes in on what needs a permit, what doesn't need a permit. And that's kind of gives you a little bit of a reasoning why. So, all right, well, guys, um, I know you're being kind of quiet, so. Thanks, if Lisa. Have... I'm going to get my chat to open. <laughs> okay. So, but if you do have questions later, just email one of us. Email if you got Jody's email, email her and we'll get back to you. Um, and if there's any Department of Ag people in here, we would love to hear from you. Stacy, there's one more question in the chat box. Um, it's on jellies and jams. Can you sell them mixed like strawberry, rhubarb, blueberry, lemon, jalapeno, honey? Okay, the, hang on, let me look here. The jalapeno thing brings up, hold up. Let me pull up the jams and jellies. Hang on, let me go through my farmer's market Bible here. The answer should be no. <laughs> yeah. 
The answer is no, but hang on, let me find. There's a jams and jelly session section on page on page 11, jams and jellies, okay? So jams and jellies, if it's a regular old strawberry jam, that's a yes, right, Lisa? Yeah, so the rules should yeah. say, unless they changed it, because they've been mm -hmm. making a lot of changes in the last year, the rules should say that it needs to be sugar, pectin, and fruit juice. And yes. your fruit juice is your, your, your strawberry or your blueberry or whatever. And then that's it. No dietary sugars are allowed. It has to be like a straight cane sugar is would, would be appropriate. No dietary sugars, no stevias, anything like that. And then no no butters, nothing acidic. That totally that changes the level that we're talking about, the level of risk. So if you're doing jalapeno, if you're wanting to do um, any kind of like hot jam or jelly, then it's not like your standard, then you have to go through additional training, additional certifications, better process control school, all that stuff. And yeah, they and actually the, have, the I'm sorry, they actually have numbers on this guide here as far as um, the, the pH level and things like that. So if you have questions, you can actually go to this document or we can talk to the Department of Ag folks, but there are specific things on here like, um, <clears throat> you know, um, I'm sorry, the pH the protein and pH in that particular jam or jelly. If it's over a certain level, then you have to go to that first further training. And the reason for that is it has to be a typical or standard recipe. If not, you have to go through process control school and the recipe will have to be tested um, in order to find out pH, ingredients, those types of things. And it's a much more difficult process. If the it's more not a basic, typical or standard easy. recipe. Right. right. So keep it basic if you can. That'll keep you from going through a lot of hoops. <clears throat> and that and comes into play when people want to do, they have this famous salsa recipe that everybody loves. And, you know, because <clears throat> it, when your recipes are different, then it, it starts to become an issue that it's not a typical standard recipe anymore. And we have a session that's going to cover jams and jellies in more detail. I believe that's May 4th. Okay, the question about teas. There's a question here about herbal teas, um, the herbal tea blends. And correct me if I'm wrong, if those are dried, like all dried, and they're not adding anything to it, that is okay, correct? See, this is like the moving target I'm talking about, okay? So yes. dried um, is fine. Is you can, yeah, dried teas, is fine. You can do tr dried herbs without any additional regulations. As long as you're not at, yeah, if you're adding that to a mix or something like that and canning it like in some kind of butter form, then you have to, of course, that adds the acidic level and adds the hazard level to it. But dried stuff, you'll be fine. Mushrooms, you can't sell wild mushrooms. Like you can't go out and get a bunch of morels that you found today, which would be yummy, but you can't go and sell a bunch of wild um, morel mushrooms. But you can sell, hang on, there's a section about mushrooms too. Let me find it. This Chicago also brings up um, the fact that sometimes we get questions in our offices that we don't know all the answers to. Um, so, and, and Dave McGill did want me to push his mushroom series. He's getting ready since we had a question about mushrooms. Um, he's getting ready to do a series of shiitake mushroom workshops across the state. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, watch that with your local extension offices. So mushrooms that are picked or foraged in the wild shall not be offered for sale at a farmer's market. Um, this guideline does not apply to cultivated mushroom species that are grown um, and mushroom species, <clears throat> if they are in package form and are, and are the product of the food processing plant. So basically you just can't go out in the wild and get mushrooms. It has to be something that you've cultivated and grown at home. Oh, next week. Thank you. Next week's program will be pricing your product with DC Nights. Um, so that will be our next program. Do you know what uh, we did? Tuesday. We got a lot of people asking questions and that was the point, right? So everything you guys are thinking of, these flowers, um, you know, we're talking about mushrooms, meats, eggs, these are good questions. So today's point, today's goal was to get you all thinking of how you're going to get to the market um, and some of, you know, some of those things, the specifics are going to come. We promise the specifics are going to come after in, later in the series. 
but think about when you get those products to market, how you're going to make them look and how you're going to market them. Who is going to buy these things and how are, how are you going to help that consumer use your product? Debbie asked the, the question and Brandy did answer it in the chat, just making sure she saw it well. Where to get copies of registration forms, jo join in local counties. Uh, Brandy's correct. Your local county extension office should be able to point you in the right direction on the how to register as a vendor from the markets closest to you. Like ours have already started, so they accept applications very, very, very early. Um, so everybody's different on their start date and if they're still seeking vendors. Um, Barbara asked a question on, we did not discuss selling perennials and flowering plants. Um, that is a little tricky. I know dependent on what type of plant it is, like the woody ornamental things that are considered nursery plants, you do need to have a nursery license for them. Um, is my understanding there aren't any regulations when it comes to selling seedlings or annuals. Um, but as far as perennial flowers, I'm not clear on that. So I don't know if Andrea knows that answer since she's, if she's still on, she might have left us. I can tell you it happens a lot and I've never heard of anyone getting in trouble for it. <laughs> Not that that means anything. I'm just letting you know that it happens. Yes, we do have lots of vendors that sell flowers at our markets. Um, not so many that are selling things like nursery, what you'd consider traditional nursery stock, like the things you would go buy at Lowe's to plant in your landscaping. Um, that's going to live for the next 15 years till it gets overgrown and you have to cut it back. It's probably good to mention too that, of course, your local market um, and counties can also have stricter regulations than what we're having. Also, uh, city municipalities can have more strict regulations. I don't think we mentioned that, but there can also be additional regulations at, at, at a local level that could be more Correct. strict. Correct. Yes. Very good point. Lisa, you are on point for putting these, um, these little links in there. She put the link on there for the nursery registration. Lisa, you're the bomb. Thank you. Oh, and Lisa, if you have it real quick, can you put up the vendor application for the Department of Ag? We probably should have added that too. Uh, that one's kind of buried. Let me find it. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Lisa, yeah. if you could just take the meeting over, that'd be great. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I'm the links girl. <laughs> put all the links in the chat, Lisa. <laughs> um, it's important, you know, as we're all chatting here about different rules and regulations, if you're a vendor or an aspiring vendor, please feel free to ask us questions. If we don't know it, we're gonna figure it out. Um, as you can see, there are a lot of parts to this farmer's market thing, okay? Like 50 million things here. And they're all, they all change, right? Sometimes, um, sometimes we're just trying to figure out what's going on this year. So um, just, just give us a call, give somebody in your county a call, an extension agent, somebody, and we'll get you on the right track to becoming a vendor. Sound good? All, all well, all's well and done. Silence means we must have answered everybody's questions or everybody's so confused they don't know what to ask. All right, Jody. I think we're done here. Okay. Hey, listen, we, we appreciate you guys all being on here. Um, it, there's 50 questions. Email 